Well, thank you very much, and, and welcome back. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, have the honor to chair this uh, first panel, the significance of the South China Sea dispute. We've got a great lineup uh, of panelists here. The, the goal of this panel is to put the, the South China Sea in context. We'll look at the big picture uh, from a, a geo, uh, geostrategic, geopolitical point of view, take a look at the economics uh, that impact uh, the, uh, the waters, uh, and, and try to put some of the economics, at least at the beginning, ahead of, of sovereignty and disputes. Uh, we've got a, a highly capable uh, lineup uh, here this morning. I'm really uh, pleased that we could uh, get my friend and colleague Patrick Cronin uh, here. Patrick, as you know, um, is a senior advisor and senior director of the Asia-Pacific Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. Patrick has been a leader of, uh, of think tanks and institutes uh, that think strategically uh, around this town, including um, here at CSIS. So it's good to have you back uh, in, the ha in the halls of CSIS, uh, Patrick. Next, we have uh, Alexander uh, Metalitsa. He is the uh, Senior Economist and Presidential Management Fellow in the Office of International um, and Integrated Energy Analysis at the U.S. Information, Energy Information uh, Administration, or the EIA. And for all of us who work on uh, the South China Sea, uh, we've all read his reports. He actually was the leader of the, of the team that wrote the reports on what, uh, what energy uh, resources are under these waters in the South China Sea. So really good to have uh, Alexander here with us today. And finally, uh, last but not least, my, uh, my colleague, uh, Murray Hebert, who's our deputy director at the, uh, the Sumitro chair at CSIS. Uh, Murray's here, and he's going to talk a little bit about protein and fish and fisheries um, and the economics of, uh, of those uh, of those things that swim uh, under the waters and, and what they mean uh, to, the, uh, to the debate. So we'll kick off. I'm going to ask the panelists to each do about 10 minutes, uh, no more than 10 minutes, please. And, uh, and then we will open up to uh, a question and answer. Uh, so Patrick, uh, would you do the honor to kick us off? Well, Ernie, thank you very much. Uh, what a tribute to uh, the work that you and Murray are doing here that uh, CSIS is doing, and also a uh, tribute to how important these issues are to have this distinguished and large audience come out for uh, this session. Um, strategically, given Asia's rise over this century and over the recent past, we can say that the South China Sea is where rising Asia is increasingly invested, contested, and congested. Right? So, you know, not to be flip, but the point is that if you're dealing with trillions of dollars of trade going through the sea lines of communication, um, including narrow choke points, um, including more than a trillion dollars for the United States, and there's a great photograph showing sea line shipping traffic. If you haven't seen it, in fact, it'll be on the cover of a forthcoming study that we'll release in a couple of days at uh, CNAS on the Asia Power Web. It's just incredible how thick the shipping traffic is. And I know you've got it on your, your great uh, maps that you put up, Bernie, uh, as well. Um, so there's a lot at stake for the economy of the region, for Asia's rise, for the United States, and for really global trade that makes it strategically significant and salient, especially since countries are first and foremost concerned about their economy. Um, it's increasingly contested, however, not just because of the six claimant states, but because of the failure to achieve agreed upon rules of the road, mechanisms for how everything from law enforcement, Coast Guard activities, to military uh, rite of passage will be conducted in the South China Sea and, in fact, globally perhaps, but this is where it's coming together in many ways uh, uh, for the worse at the moment. Um, it's a reason why Prime Minister Abe of Japan and Prime Minister Singh of India have called, um, uh, 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 talked about the confluence of two seas, uh, the, the, the throat that joins the great Indian Ocean and the great Pacific Ocean, the, the Strait of Malacca, and, and it's really the South China Sea that is, is right in the middle. Uh, and then it's increasingly um, congested, not just with the shipping traffic, um, 
but increasingly with civilian law enforcement and Coast Guard capabilities that are being built up and increasing military capabilities. So there's not quite a full-fledged arms race going on in East Asia, but more countries are buying submarines, more countries are buying Coast Guard uh, vessels, uh, and buying intelligence uh, for maritime domain awareness, for understanding the, the picture of what's going on in this region, among other capabilities. So um, this strategic significance um, of the South China Sea is um, uh, a special concern because it really is a barometer for the rise of China and relations with a rising China. So amidst all these, uh, this importance. So this is why the geography of this region matters so much. And China, for both objective and I think subjective reasons, uh, is increasingly concerned about being able to assert authority and control over its claims, over its sea lines of communication, um, over its defense. And this, because of China's size alone and because of the rapidity of its rise, is of concern because it's an uncertain future. It's a potential, it's a latent coercive power on the part of China vis-a-vis -vis, uh, mostly smaller countries uh, on the periphery, including claimant states that are uh, in uh, very much hotly contested disputes. And whether China uh, suddenly expands its core interest to further include uh, more territory offshore, as embedded in, say, the nine-dash line, is a concern that leaders and officials have in the region, even while it's not necessarily true that China is moving in that direction. But because it's unsettled and not likely to be re resolved soon, it's going to continue to be a point of contention uh, and allow opportunity for, for, uh, for tension and even accidents. Um, this, therefore, spills over into the military planning sphere in a very big way. Um, because if you're the Chinese military and you're looking to push other militaries off your shores a thousand nautical miles or more beyond the first island chain, and you're building capabilities to have a counter-intervention force or anti-access area denial capability, the United States is in turn creating capabilities to counter technologies that could prevent it from projecting power forward, not just in the South China Sea, but globally, because its security guarantees helped underwrite right stability uh, in much of the world, but especially in East Asia. And that's been the case really uh, since most of the post-World War II period. And that's now being called into question as you look out over the next couple of decades about America's ability to do that. Even more in question is the military capability of those Southeast Asian nations, those maritime Southeast Asian nations, to have their own counter-intervention force, to have their own anti-access and area denial capabilities. Can they build cost-effective, non-threatening defense capabilities that allow them to maintain law and order, Coast Guard protection, but also a modicum of defense that can reassure them that they can also support their own claims without undue coercion from larger countries? And can they meanwhile work out rules of the road, the diplomacy, and build on the trade that already exists with China and many others to help ameliorate those tensions that could lead to further suspicion, distrust, and, and even miscalculation? So these tensions are significant because um, it's really a litmus test for China's future relations with the region. Um, this is one of the, the, big, the big concerns here. Um, and here, the domestic debate in China is of concern, too, because the leadership of China, as we'll see in uh, California this weekend, perhaps with the first of many summit meetings, no doubt, between Obama and Xi, um, which I think are meant to set a more positive, constructive tone for an uncertain major relationship uh, that affects so many uh, in the world, and especially in this region. Um, despite that tone, which may be good, there's still going to be underlying concern and anxiety, as we've seen with the reports about cyber espionage, and as we see uh, about concerns over maritime cooperation. These are issues that are not easily uh, resolved, and they're being driven in part by Chinese nationalist fervor, uh, because this is China's time. China doesn't want to put up with nonsense anymore. <laughs> Um, China has, is a capable country. China is a wealthy country. It's built up its coast. It, it deserves to be able to exert its rights, and absolutely. But what we don't agree with, in the United States in particular, is uh, the right to use coercion 
to stake those claims. That is, we want to see peacefully, uh, peaceful resolution of these disputes. We want to see common uh, international rules of the road, if possible. Um, and these are the things we should be striving together to achieve. And I think they'll be talked about at the summit meeting, and that could open up and be a catalyst for uh, further cooperation. I hope it is. Um, but it is noteworthy that the Chinese use not just um, the PLA Navy, but they're using their civilian law enforcement vessels very much um, in tandem even with uh, civilian fishery fleets to uh, demonstrate claims, to assert administrative control, and even to coerce uh, smaller uh, neighboring countries. And that's, a, that's one of these gray area tensions that we're really trying to deal with. Um, the maritime disputes are in South China Sea are also uh, fueling other disputes and vice versa. And I've written about how there's a, a, unfortunately a very bad dynamic between the East and South China Seas as well, um, where the suspicions uh, grow uh, in one body of water um, and they have a, a negative impact on the other one, <laughs> it seems to me. I think the opposite could be true. We could get up with a virtuous cycle of if we can come up with some kind of set of confidence building measures, risk reduction measures, uh, transparency measures in one body of water, we may then be able to sell that to the other body of water. So here, the enlargement of these issues to think beyond the South China Sea is an opportunity potentially to try to convert uh, this spillover from being negative to being a positive uh, momentum issue. I think it's finally important for the regional institutions and what the failure to reach not just a binding code of conduct, which is a bit of a holy grail search, um, but to achieve even um, unanimity at ASEAN meetings <laughs> over the concerns on these kinds of disputes, uh, like the Scarborough Shoal issue last year, um, when China essentially uh, pushed uh, the Philippines out of the way, and you know we can point fingers ar around, but the point at the end of the day, uh, there was an, a failure for ASEAN to uh, s sort of uh, rally around a common set of rules as they could even today around the arbitration case, for instance, to try to find uh, uh, some kind of objective binding international settlement about is the nine dash line that China claims uh, based on uh, international law or is it really a claim that has little basis in contemporary international law, for instance. So there are things that can be done here if ASEAN were to uh, come together. China, of course, prefers to resolve these disputes or deal with these disputes bilaterally with other uh, claimant states that they're in dispute with. Um, but it's in, it's in the interest of the region and of the international community to find a common multilateral framework. And that's where enlarging ASEAN, um, still ASEAN-centered, but thinking about things like the East Asia Summit to include outside maritime powers that rely so heavily on these sea lines of communication, um, this, this becomes a very uh, welcome initiative. And I think the Indonesians have put forward uh, something for exactly that, that kind of forward-looking initiative. I want to stop there and, and turn over the rest of the panel. Thank you very much, Patrick. I appreciate that. Uh, let's turn now to Alexander to talk a little bit about the, the energy and, and resources outlook in the region. Okay, let me ask uh, our staff, can we put the, uh, a map of the South China Sea up for, for while well, Alexander speaks? Uh, go ahead, and uh, I think they'll they'll try to get it up for you. All right. Well, I'll try to explain the most complicated uh, geographical dispute in the world without the use of geography. The, the job of an economist is probably first and foremost not to confuse people. So if I if you all leave this discussion slightly less confused, uh, I will consider that a victory for myself. So when we hear uh, about the South China Sea in the popular press, we tend to hear terms like it's the next Persian Gulf. There are vast resources, the potential to really transform the Asian energy sphere. And I'd like, and worse over, all these vast resources are located in the disputed island chains, the Spratleys and the Paracels. So I'd like to take a few moments to talk about uh, these claims and, and what's really going on to the best of our knowledge. Uh, our work at the Energy Information Administration, we came up with an estimate of proved and probable reserves in the South China Sea. So those are reserves, energy resources, that are both technologically feasible to get out of the ground and economically viable. It makes business sense to spend the money to get them out and send them to market. 
we came up with an estimate of approximately 11 billion barrels of oil and 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, proved and probable reserves. Those are reserves that are either definitely there, that they've been discovered, or probable in that they haven't been discovered, but there's very strong evidence to suggest that they will be there. Now, that sounds like a lot of energy, and it is. It's approximately the same amount of oil as you'd find in Mexico or neighbors to the south. It's about as much gas as in all of Europe except for Russia, which happens to have a large amount of natural gas. But really, to understand what that number means, you have to look at it in the context of consumption, what these countries and what this region is consuming, how much do they actually use. Now, China consumes 9 million barrels of oil a day. That's about 3 billion a year. It consumes about 5 trillion cubic feet of gas a year. If you add up all the countries surrounding the South China Sea, you get a number of approximately 5 billion barrels of oil a year, about 10 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. That means that assuming you can get all the resources that we know with a fair amount of confidence are there right now, that's enough to power the South China Sea region for a whole two years worth of oil. Wow. And a whole 20 years, about two decades worth of natural gas. Again, significant? Yes. But compare that to the hundreds of billions of barrels of oil in countries like Saudi Arabia and Venezuela and proved reserves. Compare that to the st staggering amount of natural gas in countries like Iran and Russia, which have a quadrillion cubic feet, that's 1,000 trillion cubic feet in natural gas reserves. You start to really see that the South China Sea is not, in fact, a major new Persian Gulf, but rather an important significant regional player in terms of natural gas, and really much less so uh, in terms of oil. So let, let's talk about where, where those resources are and how they're being uh, produced and, and what's going on in these different regions, if I can get this to work. So a lot of people tend to think that the reserves are mostly in the contested areas, as we've discussed before, in the Spratly Island chains and in the Paracel Island chains. In fact, if you actually do a field-by-field -field analysis, you discover that the vast majority of proved and probable reserves are not in the, these heavily contested areas. In fact, if we go by the presentation we saw this morning, where they actually take, took a look at the real, uh, what they call the real disputed areas, uh, there, there's virtually no proven and probable natural gas and oil reserves there. Very, very small amount. The real reserve areas lie in historic oil producing areas here, Indonesia and Brunei. These are very mature fields, been producing for many, many years. You've got a lot going on in here in the Pearl River Basin, Pearl River Mouth Basin, excuse me, in China, where companies like the CNOC, the Chinese National Offshore Oil Corporation, are investing a lot of money and uh, investing in a lot of foreign technology to be able to uh, go further deep water. But again, when we say deep water, we really mean you know, out to here. You have prospective areas off the coast of Vietnam uh, that may have some potential for a good investment, but there's a fair number of technological challenges, and it's very expensive to get the oil out of there. The real success story in terms of production has been here, away from the South China Sea in the Gulf of Thailand, where you've seen a lot of cooperation between Malaysia and Thailand uh, without either country formally recognizing the other's claims to, this, to the Gulf of Thailand. They nonetheless have engaged in joint development and really made it the success story. The biggest uh, producing fields and the most successful oil and gas production is in that area. So what does that really tell us? It tells us that when you're looking at this dispute, the energy resources there are expensive and not necessarily related to the islands. There's a lot of challenges in getting them to market. So as I've discussed previously, this is more of a natural gas story than an oil story. That means you can't just drill the oil and pump it straight into the markets. You have to build expensive subsea pipelines to get it to gas processing centers, generally speaking, on shore. The South China Sea has a fairly complex geology. It has submarine valleys that make it expensive to build pipelines. It faces uh, CO2 bubbles in its fields. And it has monsoons, typhoons, a lot of adverse weather conditions. So you have to account for things like uh, you can't just have rigid uh, drilling platforms. You have to make your platforms kind of like an earthquake-proofing a building. They have to sway in the ocean or in the sea. 
So it's expensive, fairly expensive to produce, and it's a good investment for particularly mid-sized level companies. Uh, you have fields there producing, say, 20K, 20,000 barrels of oil a day, um, 50,000 maybe. You know, that's a great field. If I owned a field like that, I would be able to retire early. But when you compare it to a country like China, you know, the millions of barrels of oil in, in crude oil and products, you start to see that these fields are really drops in the bucket compared to the massive energy needs that these countries have. And so you're not going to be able to rely on the South China Sea, even if you control a large portion of it to meet your energy needs. You're really going to still have to go outside the sea uh, and import supplies. And that kind of leads me to, to my final point uh, for this presentation, is that one of the real areas of the South China Sea where we can say it's like a Persian Gulf is, in, is it's important to trade. It has one third of the world's oil pass through the Strait of Malacca, which Oh, we don't actually have here. That's a shame. But you can kind of see it here. Is uh, about a third of the world's oil passes through that narrow point every day or every year. Um, and about half of the world's natural gas, liquefied natural gas trade, mostly going to places like South Korea and Japan and China. With such massive quantities of trade, that's really where the resources are. They're not necessarily in the disputed islands, but they're in the thousands and thousands of ships that pass through this area and supply markets in Hong Kong, go on to Japan and South Korea. And that's where we see the real movements of natural resources in the area. Now, I'm going to end with, with one final note about undiscovered resources. So, you know, a lot of people would ask, well, you've been looking at proved and probable reserves. What about the stuff that we haven't seen yet that could be out there? And the U.S. Geological Survey does a great job. It's a U.S. government organization that great, does a great job of compiling the available, the best available geologic evidence um, to say that these hydrocarbons aren't discovered yet, but geologic evidence of the sea suggests that they might be there. With their studies, and the, their most recent study exclusively on this area came out in about 2010, you get another maybe 10 billion barrels of oil. So. Again, not that much, two years' worth of supply for the region as a whole, and another 100 trillion cubic feet of gas, maybe two. So these are large amounts, very significant, enough to fuel uh, parts of these countries, but not world astonishing. Now, a lot of these undiscovered resources are, again, located in the un relatively uncontested areas, the only exception being around this area in the contested Reed Bank area. There, there is a fair amount of uh, significant oil and gas deposits. And when I say significant, I mean, you know, one billion barrels of oil, maybe 25 trillion cubic feet. Now, for a country like China, uh, this isn't really that much. But for a smaller country in the region like the Philippines, uh, in terms of their energy consumption needs, that is a significant amount of oil and therefore regionally very significant for them. These countries all have domestically uh, increasing domestic production, and over the years it's going to get higher. And the rate at which their energy consumption increases is higher than the rate that we're going to see production from the South China Sea increase. That means that the South China Sea will continue to play a, regional, a role as a regional supplier, but you're not going to see you know, South, Chinese, South China Sea oil coming to ports in Europe and the United States. It's going to stay in the region, and it's going to be complemented by increasing amounts of trade through the channels in the sea. And with that, I'd like to hope that uh, you've come away a little bit more nuanced approach to what's going on in the sea, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. That was really helpful. And hadn't thought about the fact that there might be, I think what you said was there's more energy on the seas than might be under them uh, with the trade. So that was very interesting. Um, let me now turn to uh, Murray Hebert. Murray? Thanks, Ernie. Um, I'm going to talk about the dynamics of uh, fisheries in the South China Sea and the role uh, the fisheries play in the, in, in the dispute. A uh, lot of the discussion at conferences like this always focuses on issues of sovereignty. But uh, part of this panel is trying to look at the economics. And one of the things that differentiates fisheries maybe from oil and gas is that, in fact, uh, fisheries is a, is a big deal to all the disputing countries and all the, uh, all the countries surrounding the uh, South China Sea. 
I'm, I'll say up front, I'm, I'm um, not a, f a fisheries expert. Uh, maybe I was picked to do this panel because I'm a vegetarian and therefore I don't have a fish in the fight. Uh, but uh, what I've done is a little bit of research on what is known about uh, the, f the fish in the uh, South China Sea. Uh, you know, the coastal waters of Southeast Asia, China are among the most productive in, in terms of seafood in the world. Southeast Asia, which obviously includes countries beyond the South China Sea, is re responsible for producing somewhat in the, somewhere in the order of 21 million tons of fish products a year. It's about a quarter of the global production. China, uh, as an individual country, is the largest single producer, and it harvests around 13 million tons in, in 2009, the most recent figures I could find, but that's out of a total of 80 billion is really pretty significant. And, you know, if you look at how big the South China Sea is, how large the, the uh, coastline is, um, and how large the exclusive economic zone that's claimed is, it's, the exclusive economic zone is in the area of about 20 million square kilometers. So it's a huge area that is, uh, is contributing fish. And, uh, you know, in, in a lot of the countries, the, the GDP, the uh, gross domestic product, is... is con fish make up about 10% of that amount. And uh, it's fish are a huge part of the, uh, the agricultural exports of these countries. For, for a country like Vietnam, for example, it's half of Vietnam's agricultural exports, which are growing really quickly. On top of that, uh, fish, seafood, is also very important to food security within the region. Uh, somewhere in the order of 20% of animal protein uh, consumed by people in the region comes from seafood. In some countries, like Indonesia, it's actually 50 percent. So as, and as the population expands, as the population uh, gets more wealthy, there, there's increasing demands for, for seafood in the diet, and it's resulting in, in the, in the, resu the result of the increased fishing means that fish stocks have been depleted, depending on which estimates you follow, somewhere between 5 and 30 percent of their pre-unexploited levels. And as, as uh, it's harder and harder to catch fish, fishermen move increasingly far from their shores. You have Chinese fishermen that come way down on, into the uh, southern reaches of, of areas claimed by the, the Philippines and Vietnam. And you have Vietnamese and Philippi the Chinese fishermen coming to those areas. And then you have uh, uh, Vietnamese and Philippines fishermen in the area of the Spratleys. And these, the movement of these fishermen causes uh, many incidents each year. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, actually a month ago, uh, Carl and uh, Renato and I, and maybe some others in the room that I haven't seen yet, were in, a, were in Quang Ai in central Vietnam, and we got taken out uh, to an island there where we met the fisherman who had uh, had his, in late March, had had his boat, the roof of his boat burnt by, by a Chinese flare, he said. Um, we also met fishermen that had been going to the Spratleys for, excuse me, to the Paracels since, uh, since the late 70s and early 80s and could talk at length about incidents they'd, they'd had uh, with, uh, with the Chinese enforcement agencies. And you know, the, the, uh, the Chinese and, and Filipinos and Indonesians also do their own arresting of, of uh, uh, wandering fishermen uh, that they think don't have a right to be in the region. But it's, it's resulting in ramming of fishing boats and, and uh, firing uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, flares and other weapons trying to warn uh, fishermen to, to go home. Each year uh, since 1999, China has instituted a 10-week fishing ban from around mid-May to mid-August, south, uh, excuse me, north of the 12th parallel, uh, where in which it forbids fishermen, uh, foreign and domestic, from fishing uh, during this period, ostensibly to allow maritime uh, uh, resources to be replenished. And those that are caught fishing during that time uh, often have their fishing equipment confiscated. Vietnam rejects uh, China's unilateral ban on fishing, saying that it violates uh, its uh, sovereignty over the Paracels and its jurisdiction over its own EEZ. 
The Philippines also uh, rejects uh, uh, much of China's fishing ban, although it has its own fishing ban that it has had long implemented in Scarborough Shoal, which, as we've heard earlier, China uh, took over last year. And over the last 10 or 15 years, you've seen China really boosting its uh, maritime policing capabilities. Uh, it has somewhere between six, eight or so different uh, policing authorities, the largest probably being the South Sea Region Fisheries Administration Bureau of the Ministry of Agriculture's Department of Fisheries. Um, and China probably has been the most uh, vigorous in, in defending its, its territory and trying to push out fishermen uh, that come from other countries. It also uses sometimes its policing vessels to accompany fishermen as they go out, Chinese fishermen as they go out into, into disputed territories. Uh, and as and, you know, and then as I mentioned, as the as it gets harder and harder for Filipino and Vietnamese fishermen to find much much many catch much fish to catch in the areas right off its coast, they move further and further out, and so uh, you're, that's resulting in the confrontations that that we read about in the newspapers. So far, there's been little attention paid to negotiating some kind of fishery cooperation in the South China Sea. And it's really this laissez-faire approach that, that uh, results in the frictions and tensions that have, have been the uh, ultimate seeds for much of the confrontation and accidents that have, have resulted. But fisheries cooperation, in the end, could be probably a lot uh, lower risk uh, to countries and undertaking an effort at trying to figure out how to jointly explore uh, oil and gas uh, development, and uh, it could potentially uh, build a foundation for other forms of cooperation uh, leading going forward. Vietnam and China in the, uh, implemented in 2004 a, a fishing agreement in the Gulf of Tonkin in the far north just south of China and the just uh, east of, of Vietnam that could potentially serve as a model uh, for, for uh, uh, other fishing agreements going forward. But we're going to, that's maybe jumping ahead to tomorrow's discussion where we're going to talk about uh, uh, some possible ideas for resolving the conflict. So with that, Ernie, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you all for your, uh, for your excellent presentations. I'd like to uh, take the prerogative of the chair to, to start with a question. And, th and that goes, I think, to Patrick and Alexander uh, together, which is, in, in terms of um, resolving disputes through uh, proactively through joint development, Alexander, you I think mentioned the example of the Thai Malaysian cooperation in the Gulf of Thailand. Um, do either of you see models that are viable uh, to take that sort of cooperation uh, into uh, out into the disputed areas uh, in the South China Sea? And if so, how? Well, I guess my whole point is that you might not have to. Uh, in terms of joint development, what we do start to see is a lot of uh, national oil companies in the region investing in foreign expertise, uh, whether through production sharing agreements or just kind of buying the technology uh, for use in, in particularly in deep water areas. So, you know, we see a lot of technologies that were employed successfully in the Gulf of Mexico, fairly significant oil developer, a developing region, uh, applied, being applied to the South China Sea. But that's really national oil company, so one country going out and looking for foreign international companies to help it along. Other than the Malaysia uh, and Thailand joint development area, the JDA, you don't really see much evidence of this happening elsewhere in the sea. And, and to some extent, that, that's OK. Uh, if the disputed areas are the ones with the least amount of resources, you know, why bother? Um, but, if, but the problem is, uh, without that kind of cooperation, we're not going to have the ability to conduct more uh, thorough, rigorous seismic testing more, and get more accurate geologic and geographic, uh, geologic information about what's really there. So you, know, you might be shooting yourself in the foot. There might be more resources out there, and you're definitely not going to find those and develop those without the cooperation between several countries. And if it's any indication, the um, Malaysia-Thailand area is 
one of the most rich producing areas in the region. So if, if nothing else, that should serve as an indication that they might be doing something right. If you look at it from the other end of the perspective of military uh, confidence building measures or reassurance, there are obviously uh, lots of precedents uh, in history for trying to reduce incidents at sea, trying to improve maritime uh, safety, uh, cooperation, search and rescue cooperation, other kinds of military exchanges that allow for transparency. There's less when you get then to the paramilitary or the Coast Guard where there's room for much more discussion on how countries enforce their own domestic laws, um, the procedures they're going to use. So even though it didn't happen in the South China Sea, the fact that a Taiwanese fisherman was killed by the Philippines Coast Guard, that tragedy should become uh, a positive example of how to build cooperation um, so that that kind of thing does not happen uh, as a matter of course and, and trying to build those. When you get to fisheries and economic agreements and oil and energy, you've got even more actors involved. So this gets very complex. But there are a lot of models out there across the board, commercially, on, on civilian law enforcement even, but fewer there, and then with the military to military that could build uh, overarching, overlapping set of uh, institutions, mechanisms to reduce escalation, to reduce accidents, and to be able to tamp them down should they occur. Let me open the floor to uh, questions. And again, please just identify yourself and your organization. Uh, Professor Emerson. Yeah, thank you. Don Emerson, Stanford University. If I may take what I infer from Patrick's remarks, the notion that, <clears throat> for whatever reason, ASEAN is not up alone to making significant headway on the security issues. I mean, you suggested other venues, specifically the EAS. I wonder if one could apply that reasoning to the two sectors that we're dealing with in the rest of the panel. That is to say, what is the record, if indeed one exists, of ASEAN in attempting itself, or through plus arrangements, whether it's ASEAN plus one or plus three and so forth, to work out a modus vivendi, at least, in terms of fishing and energy? Uh, Alexander and Murray, you want to take a shot at that? Well, ASEAN has started to talk about uh, about uh, 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 fish fishing agreement. It's f uh, fairly uh, uh, general. Uh, it doesn't really set a, a parameters and a regulatory framework. But ASEAN, and it, that probably could be a form that could be used to to um, talk about increased. Uh, uh, how, how you divide the sea when there's when there's overlapping claims, um, and so I, I think that, that there ASEAN does have a vehicle, but it's a very weak one so far. But it could be could be enhanced for sure. In terms of energy, it's it's sort of the same story. One one of the interesting proposals that ASEAN had was a sort of ASEAN energy grid that would connect different countries together through the use of shared pipelines. And it you know it's not really. It hasn't really gotten off the ground in any meaningful sense. But if you could imagine a scenario in which pipelines are carrying South China Sea natural gas from country to country, and building up that kind of interdependency would may you know increase the, the likelihood of cooperation and joint development of these areas. So that's a potential there, but, but we haven't seen anything other than um, scar uh, sparse bilateral and negotiations that often as not don't go anywhere. Okay, uh, the gentleman here in the front. Hi, Renato De Castro from the Philippines. I, uh, oh. It's not loud enough. Uh, I'm Renato De Castro from the Philippines. I'd like to address my question to Dr. Cronin. You talk about the growing military tension in the region. Yeah, you might have confidence building measure, but that will not solve those uh, problems. It might manage it because you still have the tension there. Tension uh, arises from the fact that you have a very expansive maritime claim, and other countries simply will not give in. So my question is, what will be, the think, the role of the United States, given the fact that the United States has the largest naval force in that part of the world, plus, of course, U.S. alliance? So where do you factor in the United States? 
Well, thank you for the question. Certainly you're right that this is not uh, a resolution for all time, and I didn't mean to suggest that. In fact, because we cannot expect resolution, definitive resolution of these many different types of overlapping disputes, um, that's exactly why countries in the region, not just the United States, need to focus on measures to reduce the risk of accident uh, escalation. But answering your question, the United States policy, I believe, right now as we rebalance rebalancing, and hopefully we're not losing focus on Asia Pacific, Ernie, um, but, but there are some of us worried that we might. Um, I think that um, uh, the answer to that is the United States needs to balance um, reassuring our allies and partners with good, firm security commitments and cooperation to help build their capacity, and at the same time, strategic reassurance, including especially with China, um, where we try to prevent unnecessary arms racing, where we try to uh, reduce suspicions, where we try to find those risk reduction in, in accident uh, avoidance kind of measures, um, even while there's competition, even while there's uh, deterrence and dissuasion going on. So it is a balancing act. It's not, it's not a black and white issue. It's a matter of the United States trying to play a positive stabilizing role, not because the military issue should be in the lead, but because we need it as the undergirding insurance policy to continue the prosperity for all in a rules-based system that we can all sign up to and we can all know how we resolve disputes when they happen. That's the ideal. Now, the reality is much messier than that, much more difficult, and we see Asia follow sequestration and concerns about the U.S. budget. We see them, on the one hand, we, we're a declining power from day to day. On the other hand, we're, we're, we're militarizing the region, you know, for, if you read some of the Chinese press. Um, we have to be in the, in the middle of those two. We're not there to create problems. The United States needs to be there to help uh, underwrite solutions, to find solutions. So we're the stabilizing power. That's the role we want to be. Um, we want a rules-based system. Um, we want there to be a region free from coercion and to maximize uh, prosperity and freedom. And that's, that's the objective of these alliances. But we don't want to be entrapped in small conflicts, not of our making. Um, and we don't want, to, on the other hand, to see uh, friendly countries and especially allies um, coerced by large powers. So that's why this is a very tricky set of diplomatic, economic, and military engagement policies that we have to pursue in tandem with others. Dr. DeCastro, I'd like to add, I mean, I, I think it's important. Uh, I think the Americans are getting signals from, <coughs> from ASEAN, and, and ASEAN, and ASEAN leaders, and ASEAN leaders are, are starting to, to gain confidence themselves and voice on an issue that I, I think is important. I think one theme that has popped out over the past couple of weeks, um, uh, Vietnamese Prime Minister Nguyen Tan Dung uh, just talked uh, a couple of days ago at the Shangri-La Dialogue about the concept of strategic trust. And I thought I was, uh, that really rung in my ear because um, just a week before that, uh, the Indonesian Foreign Minister Marty Nadalagawa was here in, at CSIS and talked about strategic trust also. And I think um, this is something that the United States is trying to interpret along the lines of what uh, Dr. Cronin uh, just mentioned. Uh, to put it more simply, uh, this is sort of the, um, uh, and using uh, Grimm's fairy tales analogies, this is the, uh, um, uh, uh, um, the three bears, you know, the you have to not too hot, not too cold. You got to get it just the Goldilocks, right? Thank you. My kids would really be upset. <laughs> Couldn't pull the Goldilocks analogy out. But um, I think that's that's important, and I and I think uh, the message for U.S. policymakers that we've been trying to impart from CSIS is that. Um, Treaty alliances are the core. Uh, they're the pillars of our engagement in Asia. Those are important, but they uh, are advised and improved on by um, this development of regional architecture. And these region, the regional architecture uh, creates um, a framework whereby you can start to build strategic trust and a, and the, a web of um, uh, decision making and rules making that includes equity or buy-in from all the countries, hopefully including China, right? China, you have to have the big guy making uh, in the region, uh, making the rules and then playing by the rules. So I think this is what we're trying to invest in now. Uh, and in the meantime, 
mitigate the opportunity for conflict and mistakes but through uh, some some really effective mechanisms that we're, we're going to discuss here over the next couple of days. Uh, Dr. Thayer. Thank you. Carl Thayer from the Australian Defense Force Academy. Uh, two quick questions. Alexander, could you comment on the Vietnam-Malaysia joint development of oil, which was missing, I think, from your presentation? And two, to anybody on the panel or in the room, that this morning I woke up uh, to quotes being sent to me that the Malaysian Prime Minister Najib has promoted joint development, particularly with China, as a way of preventing the intervention by external powers. Uh, and I, I was wondering if anybody can clarify that or are you aware of it and what, what, what does that mean? Is it a change of Malaysian policy? And who were the external powers? Were they oil companies or states that he was referring to? Okay, so heads up, I'm going to look for some of the Malaysian experts in the room. And, uh, and Alexander, you'll take the first uh, question, please. Uh, sure. So the question was on uh, Vietnamese-Malaysian uh, cooperation. Uh, it's it's not as extensive as the um, the Thailand-Malaysian development, uh, but it is significant. The companies uh, uh, jointly operate several of the fields, sort of in between the two countries. Uh, I think they produce somewhere in the magnitude of a hundred thousand barrels of oil a day. Um, and I don't remember exactly how much gas, but so significant numbers. Uh, it's profitable for all those companies there, and they're certainly going to continue doing that business. Uh, there's, there's not much more I can say on, on that. Uh, can the panel um, talk about the Malaysia question? You, you have any information on that? I don't. Uh, I have nothing new. I mean, it's been right? So this statement is an interesting, novel statement. Why would, why would Najib have to make the statement, since, in fact, this has been ongoing cooperation? But I defer to others who may be following this closely. Did anyone, anyone in the audience want to comment on the, Malay, the Prime Minister of Malaysia's statement? No. Uh, well, Carl, I know there's a very interesting person here from the Prime Minister's office in town, uh, so we will we'll reach out to him and get you an answer by lunch. <laughs> uh, a question here in the front, uh, Mr. Tweed. Yeah. Um, thank you. I'm uh, Chun Chung Tui from uh, Diplomatic Archive of Vietnam. I have a question for four American panelists here. How sig significant the South China Sea for U.S. in terms of uh, strategically, economically, and diplomatically? Well, um, I, I thought I'd try to outline why it's strategically significant, and I was obviously speaking from an American perspective, even while trying to take into account uh, the perspectives of others in the region. Um, it is uh, economically um, important because... ASEAN has become, in its of itself, uh, a, a vital economic partner um, for the United States, one that we're uh, increasingly building ties. I mean, the former Assistant Secretary Kurt Campbell, who set up the Asia Group, uh, is out literally doing business now with nothing but trying to help American businesses break in, mostly to Southeast Asia and ASEAN. That's not just South China Sea, but obviously because of the sea lines of communication, South China Sea is central to ASEAN in that engagement. So therefore, the diplomatic engagement that we've seen under the Obama administration in the last four years where we've stepped up diplomacy in the region, including joining East Asia Summit and uh, attending all the meetings uh, that are uh, offered in the, in the uh, uh, sort of region, especially under ASEAN auspices that we're invited to, um, we need to maintain that and sustain that. That's very important for the United States to do that. And I think that's recognized on both sides of the aisle in Washington. I hope it's sustained and followed through. Militarily, it's hard to say that the region itself on the South China Sea is the center of the military security issues for the United States, which are global. But the rebalancing to Asia Pacific includes the military component, as we've heard from Admiral Locklear, as we've heard from Secretary Hagel, as we've heard from uh, their predecessors uh, in senior defense positions. And that's because of the need for the United States to reassure allies and partners in a rising dynamic region at a time when China's rising, and yet at the same time to ensure that we can manage a, a constructive relationship overall with China and show that we're there not to force countries to choose sides between China and the United States, but rather that great powers can figure out rules of the road to manage things to figure out, even while we compete 
uh, and have some suspicions and some distrust and have cyber hacking and other problems that we don't know how to resolve quickly, um, we think overall keeping a strong posture of presence and engagement militarily too uh, is a way to build capacity in this region so that it can realize its uh, full potential. Uh, me, might just add on the uh, twee, Dr. Twee also asked about the economics and uh, Alexander did talk about the shipment of oil and gas which was r really uh, obviously very critical to the economies of of China, Korea, Japan, etc. And but beyond that there's also the global supply chain which is well and alive in Asia, the movement of of uh, pro uh, parts for for electronics and other equipment that move between Southeast Asia and, and China, the South China Sea, some of it moves by airplane obviously, but the South China Sea is also very critical for that and so it is absolutely, uh, the South China Sea is economically also very important to the U.S. for that reason. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Um, you looked at the models for joint development earlier, and I would like to bring attention to another concept, models of joint conservation and protection of the marine environment in the South China Sea. In this panel, we talk about energy, we talk about fisheries, but maybe in the future, there's a need to include uh, environmentalists to talk about how to protect marine environment and joint conservation and protection of that important body of water. Now, I have two questions addressed to Mr. Matelisa and Mr. He Hebert. The first one, I'm not, not a vegetarian. So I can take your share of uh, the fish, uh, bluefin tuna. Of, um, I'm a seafood a lover. I'm not a vegetarian. But my question is, is it possible to propose to combine or expand the regional fisheries management organization in the Western Pacific to include the South China Sea? Because in the South China Sea, there's no such RFMO. But it's very important to, to deal with IUU fishing issue, the depletion of fishery resources, and so on, the joint conservation protection, including we, we are seeing more disputes coming from the, the, the fishing vessel from different parties in the region. So in that, that kind of concept, joint conservation development of fishery resources in the South China Sea, in, in terms of disputes, we are able to use the arbitration process or article in the WCPFC, I'm talking about Western Pacific Fisheries Com uh, Management Com uh, Commission. So that would be very important we think about that, how to deal with those disputes in that uh, South China Sea. Second question uh, addressed to Mr. Matilisa in March 2005, there was a tripartite agreement uh, among the three national oil companies, the Philippines, Vietnam, and China. And then and the second stage is stopped in the end 2008. So how do you assess any kind of information finding you got from the result of the first phase of research, joint study in the disputed, con contested area, any oil and gas found in that area? If no, how come we are seeing more action taken by the parties in the country to develop oil and gas in the contested area? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the second question was about the JMSU, the Joint Maritime Seismic Understanding. Um, Murray, you want to start? Uh, on the fisheries, I mean, I think that's an ex excellent model. You suggested the, uh, the uh, regional fisheries agreement in the West Pacific. I think that could have, have some uh, models that could be applied. It could be expanded, no doubt. I think what it needs, though, is Right now, it's, it, it doesn't have quite the profile of, of the hydrocarbons that Alex is talking about. And I think it needs somebody, some leader, to, to tr start to drive this. But I, I do think that, that that would be an excellent model to, to look at. And I think it would be an, uh, uh, um, you know, an, an excellent um, proposal for somebody to make. I don't know if it can go in some regional architecture like the East Asia Summit or or what, but you know, it would, would provide, uh, would ensure that you would have more fish for guys like you that need to eat these things and down the road. <laughs> Alex? 
I'm not sure exactly how to answer the question other than, than to say, if you want to evaluate the success of joint cooperation in seismic activity or geologic investigation, I suppose one metric would be, you know, has the amount of resources you think is under that area increased since your last assessment of the area? We one of the problems is that there is a uh, not much good data, and there's a lot of contradicting reports, um, particularly among the different claimants to the disputed areas, that all tend to say different things, and and there's no real independent auditing or evaluation mechanism to test whether those claims are accurate. So. We tend to use um, U.S. Geological Survey data, which the United States considers to be the gold standard in assessing um, and synthesizing geologic information from across the world. Um, and to, to that degree, again, from their studies, and you can find them online, they're freely available, uh, they don't suggest particularly large quantities of oil and natural gas, conventional oil and natural gas resources in, in the Spratly uh, sorry, in the Paracel Islands, um, much at all, and, and only uh, marginally more in the Spratly Islands. Uh, so more geolog more cooperation to get better seismic data uh, would be great. I think it would be very useful. Uh, but at least from the best available w information we have today, uh, the picture doesn't look particularly promising. I'd like to just build on this for, for a moment, because I think the JMSU is an important uh, uh, case study in, in regional cooperation and joint development. Um, I think if you, if you look at the, the politics and the trust that were around the JMSU, from the beginning, this is the joint maritime seismic understanding. From the beginning, the, the, the foundation of, of trust between countries uh, for that plan was, was on a rocky foundation. Um, so in a way, uh, I think if you take Hanoi's perspective, for instance, that was never going to work. Uh, it was sort of foist upon the Vietnamese, and the deal was done between um, some individuals in the Philippines and China that w didn't have national support and didn't have a lot of transparency. Uh, so I think this is important, right? Because as a lesson learned, uh, joint development has to be um, built on trust and transparency w and related to the domestic politics of each of the countries. Um, so. This makes joint development complicated, uh, tricky, but something that uh, it's going to take real leadership to, to develop. And we're going to get into this uh, across the, our discussions today. But I, I've made a note, because we've, we've done some work on the JMSU here at CSIS. We probably need to do some more as a follow-up to this conference. Thank you for the good question. Uh, a two-finger, uh, please. Uh, uh, same person. He's got a two-finger follow-up. Just one second. I think I would like to bring your attention to the 2002 declaration, declaration on conduct with party. Based upon that, you had that kind of a development in 2005. Thank you. Good point. Uh, the gentleman in the back here, um, by the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had Ambassador Quisha first. Sorry, Ambassador. I know you just, I knew you flew in from Alaska, especially for this uh, conference. <clears throat> first, let me congratulate you, Ernie, and, and CSIS for conducting this third um, forum on the South China Sea. And I also commend the panelists for their excellent presentations. Um, my question is to Dr. Cronin. Um, the US has consistently maintained that they would like to see freedom of navigation uh, respected by all countries. Um, some months ago, uh, Chinese authorities um, announced that they would, that they reserve the right to board any vessels that pass through the South China Sea. Um, I don't recall having seen any statement from the U.S. with regard to that um, statement made by the Chinese authorities. In the Scarborough Shoal incident last year, um, the Chinese um, um, placed a barrier on the mouth of the Scarborough Shoal, preventing our vessels, including the fishing vessels, from entering the Scarborough Shoal, which is part, in our, of course, contention part of uh, Philippine uh, exclusive economic zone. 
Um, of course, we did not take any action against that. Um, but it, it seems that, that that freedom of navigation principle has been, has been um, violated. And, and so I wonder what the U.S. Uh, position is with regard to that. Well, Mr. Ambassador, I'm sure you have uh, discussions with U.S. officials all the time on, uh, on related issues, so I'm not sure how much I want to tread into this, but I mean, several general things need to be said. Um, one of them is that I share your concern, Mr. Ambassador, about uh, China's use of coercive uh, power um, and possible unilateralism um, to press its, its claims. And uh, as recently as this weekend, I think Admiral Locklear uh, restated part of U.S. policy, which is not to accept this unilateral use of coercion or coercive power to uh, settle disputes or to make their uh, claims. So we're deeply concerned, and we were deeply involved as a government in helping to support the Philippines um, in uh, building its capacity to maintain coastal defenses, uh, its military capacity. Um, these are steps that should continue. But on the other hand, we also ha all have a shared interest in making sure these things don't escalate into a conflict. So we're looking for ways, obviously, to create acceptable multilateral rules of the road um, so that there's not this unilateral coercive uh, use of force. And we need the Philippines uh, as an ally uh, dealing with these issues and supported by Vietnam and supported by, frankly, all ASEAN. Uh, and supported by outside countries like India and Japan, which depend so heavily on these maritime uh, sea lines of communication, to ensure that uh, China uh, is not allowed to, to essentially get away with unilateralism on this issue. Um, that being said, every country has a responsibility to make sure um, we're being restrained in how we go about um, exercising our defense and our law enforcement, um, especially when you've got uh, known disputes uh, in known disputed areas. Anyway, I, I th I'm, I'm with you on this. I think more work needs to be done on the maritime security dimensions of this. It's going to take a lot of work and a lot of leadership, as Ernie Bauer said, um, not just on the joint opportunities, but frankly on these risk reduction measures and common rules of the road. Okay, I'm going to go to the uh, admiral because he outranks the next questioner, <laughs> and then uh, and then over here. Thank you very much, uh, retired advisor General Kaneda from Japan. My question is related to the uh, the, the last question uh, by uh, Ambassador to uh, uh, Patrick. Okay, um, uh, in 2009, there was a in so-called impeccable incident in the South China Sea. And uh, very recently, uh, there was a report that uh, Admiral Leclerc uh, said that he recognized that uh, very recently the Chinese Navy uh, acti naval activity was uh, found in uh, uh, EEZ of the United States. I'm not sure uh, that exactly, but uh, where uh, are they? And uh, what are their purpose uh, to do? and what kind of uh, uh, activity they did. And uh, I, uh, okay, so uh, what, what's the, uh, and also I'd like to uh, uh, know about the, uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, re response to that, uh, the Chinese action. Thank you. Could you sort of restate his? Yes, Admiral Canada, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, which gets to a different issue of freedom of navigation, which I didn't really address uh, from the Philippine ambassador. Um, and that's really this uh, military passage through the exclusive economic zones of other countries. And the United States maintains, along with the majority of countries, that the right of innocent passage includes military vessels. Obviously, China is concerned about spying on their submarine bases in Hainan, among other things, when the U.S. naval ships, like impeccable, um, are conducting right of innocent passage, but with sensors uh, and arrays that might happen to pick up submarine traffic uh, in the South China Sea. Um, what the Chinese now are saying is that, by the way, we're intruding, in, or not intruding, they didn't use that word, but we are uh, passing through your exclusive economic zones, whether that's around territories like Guam 
or whether it's maybe in the Caribbean in now or in the future. This is something that we lived with on a regular basis through the Cold War with the Soviet Union. We're not in the Cold War. China's not the Soviet Union. But at the same time, you're dealing with large growing maritime capabilities um, where there's a great interest in knowing what the other is up to. Um, I think this issue, and we'll, I'm looking forward to sessions next month and in the future with you and others, to talk about things like theater anti-submarine warfare, growing uh, exercising and training that the region should be conducting. Prime Minister Abe has spoken eloquently about the democratic diamonds of India, Australia, the United States. And while that sounds like containment to Chinese, to me it sounds like a rules-based system for making sure that there's good maritime domain awareness uh, when there are growing potential threats to sea lines of communication. Um, and, uh, and China's going to be investigating these things, so they're going to be using their increased maritime power to investigate. And I think that's fine as long as we can come up with agreed rules of the road. I'm Stanley Kober. Whenever I go to these meetings, I hear about the importance of our alliances. One alliance that is never mentioned is the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. This is not the first time we have rebalanced to Asia. What are the lessons of that experience for the current rebalancing? Anybody want to take a swing at this one? <laughs> I mean, you know, Stanley, we, we could have a Cold War discussion for a long time. Um, you know, it's, it's a serious question. Um, one lesson is to avoid uh, protracted ground wars uh, uh, anywhere. <laughs> um, because it was Vietnam that uh, not only led to much of the downfall of the U.S. position in Southeast Asia before, not so much CETO. CETO was an unnatural alliance. That's why it was really, it was crafted in the Cold War in an ideological setting of East-West tussle. But it was that protracted ground war that caused the region to see America retreating, withdrawing, which created a great deal of anxiety. ASEAN came together to fill that vacuum with an economic political grouping that has become incredibly successful despite all of its limitations that we've talked about in, in dealing with big security issues, for instance, which is a, a relatively new sphere. We're not talking about alliances with ASEAN. We're talking about the United States recognizing its comprehensive interests economically, militarily, politically, are increasingly tethered to a rising Asia, which is centered on East Asia. And it's ASEAN countries that are at the center of this great power relations in this region. So um, I think the lessons are not to get pulled into a ground war, not to get pulled into war at all but to make sure that we can find common rules of the road, win-win situations, if you will, uh, economically and politically. And that takes work. It takes government effort. It takes private sector effort. It doesn't just happen. Um, and it's people like the people in this room and people at CSIS in this program um, who are trying to come up with constructive ideas for how to inch these things forward and avert really bad things from derailing it. Lady right here. Uh A reporter from The Voice of America. Uh, I have a question here. Everybody this morning talking about the joint possibility of joint development in the South China Sea. So I have a question here. If the, all the countries involved in these disputes do agree with a joint, a joint development, so what is the U.S. role now since everybody do not need U.S.? So will U.S. be excluded as an external force, <laughs> external power? Thank you. Uh, well, I, I, I'll go ahead and start on this one. I think, no, I don't think the United States would be excluded at all. I mean, we're, we're actually, if you look at um, uh, actual development and, and economics in, in the South China Sea, and, and I think Alex, Alexander made a really good point earlier that a lot of the energy and the development, or the, or the energy and resources are on the seas, riding over those seas. Um, and American companies are intimately engaged in, in both the development of uh, hydrocarbons, uh, gas, and um, 
uh, and oil uh, exploration. And we're also involved in the, in the shipping and, and uh, pr production of oil that's shipped over the seas. So, um, y you know, I think there's no question but, but that the Americans are going to be involved in, in development, in this joint development in the South China Sea in a commercial sense. Absolutely, just it's happened already and it's de facto. I think we'll, we'll be part of these uh, discussions. I think that you're, you're raising an interesting question, which is, um, are these are these waters the waters that are actually going to connect uh, the countries of the East Asia Summit, or are they going to divide these countries? And I think the, what we've made the case for here this morning is that it's there's a compelling case, if you look at the economics, that these waters absolutely must connect the countries, and they do connect the countries now. Um, the question is, how do you uh, accommodate or, or think about a rising China who has decided to um, take a sovereign, uh, a very sovereign view of uh, most of that water, uh, and how do you um, how do you convince China to um, get the benefits of the economic development, shared economic development, uh, in a way that uh, doesn't challenge or threaten security, which could spill if it if there were conflicts, if there were ever you know God forbid war uh, in the around South China Sea related issues. Um, the impact on the economic and the economies, I think this is what this panel is trying to say, uh, of all of our countries, the United, everybody in the globe. I mean, we could see the impact of, of flooding in Thailand, for instance, impacted Japan and Europe and, and American supply chains to a degree that would, you know, shock people. But can you imagine war in the South China Sea? Um, this would uh, substantially um, disrupt uh, global commerce. So I think. Um, these are the. This is the way I think about it. Um, there's no uh, talking about uh, the Americans not being included in joint development is. Uh, it's just a non-starter, and it's 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 already a foregone conclusion. I think we are involved. I don't know. We'd welcome just, other views. Just one different point that I'd like to add to. I agree with everything Ernie Bauer just said. But if you look within the region rather than the region as a whole. Um, you have to be very impressed by the inter-Asian economic, political, and even developing military and security ties. Yeah. So we have a report coming out this next week on the Emerging Asia Power Web that looks at it's not the United States that's involved. Asian countries are taking it upon themselves to build security relations, cross-servicing agreements, joint exercises and training, research and development exercises, on top of very firm and growing economic relations. So for them to have local, bilateral, trilateral, economic joint development agreements very much fit with w the, the trends in this region. So that's why the United States has to not disengage from this region, but has to s sustain this high level of engagement so we keep up with the some of the important trends, but we're not, we're, not, we're not involved in everything. This is an Asian, largely Asian-driven development. Uh, thank you, Davis Robbins. Roland Mooring, I was the legal advisor to the Department of State in the early 1980s when the law of the Sea Convention was uh, finalized. And just as a historical note, um, the freedom of navigation in the exclusive economic zone and the right of innocent passage through international straits, which obviously includes submarines underwater, there is no way that the United States would have gone, even though we have not uh, ratified the law of the Sea Convention, we would not have ever gone from the three-mile limit to the 12-mile limit unless we were certain the law of the Sea Convention would be read the way it should be read. That's a great point. Anyone want to care to comment on it? Thank you for that intervention. That was very helpful. Gentleman in the center here. The microphone's on its way to you. Stephen Piper, just, just to follow up, you're talking about international cooperation, international rules of the road, uh, maritime security, working together with allies. Is there any chance that the United States will participate in UNCLOS, will ratify it? Because that seems to be, we are us and the rest of you follow the international law. Yeah, uh, I'd like to start on this one. We, we have been absolutely uh, 
clear at CSIS that, that the Senate, we believe the Senate should immediately um, uh, ratify that treaty and, and, and join. Our, our chairman and CEO, our president and CEO, John Hamry, has uh, spoken on this often and has uh, put um, op-eds in the Wall Street Journal and other, uh, and other papers that, that some of us up here helped write. Uh, so we, we strongly believe that. I'd, I'd be welcome other views of the, will, will we pass it? Uh, is there a prospect for that? Well, if CSIS recommends it, there's a chance. Yeah. <laughs> I hope we got that down on social media. <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, the lady here, I'll come back to you in a second. Thank you. My name is Jean Ning Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I'd like to especially thank Marie Hubert for your topic. I thank you very much. And I come back to follow up with the questions that Dr. Chen Chung Thuy raised. And I'd like to ask Dr. Patrick Cronin about the strategic points of it. And since our President Obama is meeting up with President Xi next week, would you specifically point out the global strategy vision, strategic visions that both the US and China can share, especially in the interconnected water of Indo-Pacific Ocean? And with your expertise, Dr. Cronin, would you go further into the air, sea, space, cyberspace, and also nuclear proliferation, significant aspect of the South China Sea. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. Did you say you were with the Vietnamese vegetarians of America? <laughs> I'm with the Vietnamese fisheries, okay. too. But I'm with voice of Vietnamese Americans. And we encompass everything. Thank you. Well, thanks for your questions. I think <clears throat> as a, a student of, of summit diplomacy, a long time student of summit diplomacy, we have to be realistic about what summits can achieve. Um, they're mostly about atmospherics, and that can be very good, especially when you have tension between great powers. So um, you have in Xi Jinping, obviously, a new leader of China, uh, a leader about whom some very interesting things are being said. Uh, I think I read George Schultz in the Wall Street Journal today talking about how he really expects um, this summit to be quite interesting because Xi Jinping is bringing in some fresh voices and ideas. I hope that's the case. Um, and I think <clears throat> it's important for President Obama to um, not only listen to him and to find what opportunity there is for cooperation, what opportunity there is for a joint vision that would be good for the whole region, not just good for China and the United States, but also to raise some very frank differences that exist. And obviously, Tom Donilon, we now le learn that Tom Donilon will be leaving shortly. Um, the position of national security uh, sort of advisor to the president. Uh, but um, he's been uh, the spokesman, really, for the president and the administration to raise sensitive problems that we've had on cyber espionage, for instance. I think, similarly, we've had a lot of questions and tensions over the last several years with China over the maritime claims over maritime disputes, over maritime rules of the road, if you will. And at least even while setting the tone um, and being frank, I think it's possible for the, the two leaders to build on some of the previous security and economic dialogue that's occurred over the last several years um, in the maritime space. And this obviously very much centered on South, but also the East China Seas, where we want not only bilateral maritime cooperation on how to reduce risk, accident, improve transparency, improve agreement on rules of the road, um, but we want to see China do this with its neighbors uh, in the region. Um, so while we're all waiting for a binding code of conduct but not holding our breath, um, it's very important to fill in this space with practical steps that can be taken um, with Vietnam, with the Philippines, with all of ASEAN, with Japan, uh, with, uh, with, um, with every country in the region. So that's what I'm hoping can at least be catalyzed by a summit meeting. But the details are going to have to be worked out by experts, by officials, by painstaking diplomacy, military and diplomatic diplomacy, even commercial diplomacy uh, in the years to come. So we need um, institutions like ASEAN working yeah. with outside powers, the plus mechanism, to bring these people together and keep uh, uh, the high focus on the agenda. What's most important? What, what can we achieve? What's realistic? 
I just want to um, underline this because I think it's really important. I think one of the key messages that will come out of this conference is we just urge the Chinese colleagues not to try to, uh, I mean, they've gone to extreme measures to try to keep the, the discussion of the South China Sea and maritime security out of the discussions at the East Asia Summit and the ASEAN discussions. And it doesn't make sense. Um, come in and talk about it. Uh, put it on the table, and that, that's what I think everyone's talking about when Win Ten Zom talks about strategic trust, when Marty Nata Lagawa talks about strategic trust. You can't build strategic, tr strategic trust, I can't say it, um, <laughs> unless you uh, talk to each other and you understand uh, the other p party's positions together in a, in a group, not just bilaterally, but together as a group, and, and I think I think we'll look back in history and find out that China will, um, I believe, will embrace this, uh, these uh, opportunities to discuss uh, these issues, and it will mature its position, uh, which will be, which will enhance security for, for China and all of the rest of, uh, of everybody around the uh, Indo-Pacific. Andre, I see you poised there uh, to jump in. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, my question, well, I, I, I like her strategic broad question. I want to ask a narrower, specific question. And that is, oh, first of all, I'm Andre Sauvageau, the, the um, chief representative for a company in Detroit called Interstate Traveler Company. We want to get our high rail into Vietnam and a lot of other countries too, but anyway. Andre, no commercials. <laughs> yeah, no commercial. <laughs> um, well, I just identification. Anyway, um, <laughs> the, um, the question I have is, and it follows on from Dr. Cronin's, uh, I think, excellent uh, discussion of how we're trying to, the Obama administration trying to um, reduce the uh, 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 potential for violence, uh, don't approve adjudicating these differences through violence, and you mentioned specifically, Doctor, that um, our commendable uh, support for improving the Philippines uh, defense forces just uh, so they can sort of take care of their own coastal waters. And so the, my question is then, why not lift the uh, acronistic uh, embargo against uh, the export of lethal weapons to Vietnam, which again would just be in the same spirit of what you mentioned doing with the Philippines. It, um, anyway, that's the question. Well, uh, thank you for that. Uh, you know, it's not the first time we've raised now issues uh, for, for Congress to deal with as well as the executive branch and, and as someone who's not in government at the moment, I, I don't feel like um, I, can, I can change the policy quickly. But there are some good reasons to um, s say why we shouldn't necessarily sell lethal arms to Vietnam, and that's because um, it would be definitely a red flag with China. Um, Vietnam has uh, no shortage of arms suppliers. Uh, it's got a very close relationship with Russia in particular. And while I'd love for everybody to buy American, um, <laughs> the, um, you know, the reality is that uh, there, there's no shortage of arms supply. I will be in Vietnam in a couple of weeks, and um, I'll certainly be talking about these and other issues, um, because we do have a growing strategic dialogue with Vietnam, and that's very important. That's where it's the human capacity uh, and the business potential that I think uh, really needs to grow, and it's not necessarily in the offensive military arms area that should be the, the lead edge of that kind of cooperation. I don't, and I know you weren't suggesting that, but I think that um, we, we have a, a warming relationship with Vietnam, and I think we need to see it improve. Okay, a uh, question behind the camera. Could I add yeah. something oh. to that? Th this is just on a related note. A lot of the countries, as I mentioned previously, there are a lot of challenges to developing resources in the sea. Pretty much all the countries and all the companies, the national oil companies, with the possible exception of CNOC, don't really have the capacity right now to develop the South China Sea's resources on their own. So you're going to need foreign companies to come in. You're going to need foreign expertise, uh, foreign ser uh, oil service form firms like Schlumberger to come in. And, and without that, you're not going to be able to, particularly if you're, if you're not China, you're not going to be able to develop uh, your country's resources, and certainly those firms are much less likely to come in when they see uh, all these disputes and when they, they see that the atmosphere between the, their home countries and the countries in the South China Sea 
is so tense. Good point. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman behind the camera, we've, we found you finally. Thank you, Mr. The Chairman. <coughs> I am a lawyer from Canada. And uh, for my personal interest, before I ask my question, I want to support the answer of Mr. Patrick Conan to the question addressed by uh, the lady from the VOA. Uh, the state, unit states that have the right and the obligation to get involved in this dispute in the Southeast Asia Sea. Because I remind you that uh, the, the United States have already signed an international treaty in 1973 to protect to, uh, the integ integrity of Vietnam. I remind you, in 1973, there is a conference, an international conference in Paris on Vietnam. And after the conference, nine countries have signed a final act. In the final act, provision two and four, these nine countries, including China, accept to protect the integrity of Vietnam. Now, the United States state and China have the right and the obligation to solve, to find a solution for this problem. Now, my question addre uh, is addressed to Mr. Medlitsa. You minimize the reserve of oil in this region. I have read in different articles by um, Professor jo Gavar John and Chi Kim Lo in um, uh, 1989 that the oil reserve evaluated by China is 196 billion of barrel of oil in 1989. Why do you minimize it? Is it because you don't want the state to get involved in this dispute? Thank you. We employ a large variety of sources, industry publications, uh, trade press, and we try to look at the holistic picture. We try to do a field by field analysis looking field by field, what's in there, what can we reasonably accept, expect with the reasonable probability to be there in order to make calculations about reserves. Chinese have actually released several s different studies uh, with reserve estimates for the South China Sea. And those studies are, well, they, they don't match up. They're different numbers each time. And no uh, independent auditors have confirmed the Chinese numbers. So while we recognize that as a source. Uh, we just don't have the evidence to suggest that the oil, the, particularly the oil that uh, those estimates are saying is there, really is. I mean, there, it's just not in the field. So where is it? OK, um, thank you for that. Uh, Chris. Thank you very much, Ernie. Great discussion, as always. Um, I can see uh, Bonnie Glazer and Chris Lamera sitting over there. We were all out at Shangri-La this weekend, so feel free to jump in if I'm mischaracterizing something. But the, one of, perhaps the major theme, uh, in addition to uh, will the Americans have the money to actually carry out the pivot down the road, was uh, what are we going to do about the increasingly aggressive or slash coercive Chinese use of paramilitary force and in some cases implicit military force? Uh, the question came up again and again. Bonnie asked the question absolutely explicitly to the deputy chief of the Chinese general staff, and the answer basically was, huh, what are you talking about? Those are our islands. We're not doing anything. It's your problem. And, and you know, they just simply refused to engage on the issue of, of either contention or that coercion force are pretty damn close. W what can we do about that? Uh, and on the Philippines question, uh, and this is Chris Lemaire, uh, please jump in, uh, just put out a really excellent book on, on all this, uh, available on Amazon, no doubt, um, pointed out that the Chinese have in a, already, in effect, taken over the, uh, uh, the Philippines fishing grounds. So the idea of, of well, we've got to build up there, for, it's, it's, it's already gone. That, that was the, you know, the gist of the hallway discussion and, and the speeches. The final, last point. Uh, the Vietnamese sent uh, their prime minister and uh, gave the keynote speech on Friday night. And 
uh, it was an enormous condemnation of Chinese activities done very cleverly, sort of the ASEAN way. He didn't go China, China, China. He listed all the 400 really bad things that are happening, and we're all, everybody in the room goes, oh, we know who he's talking about. So it was, it was done very cleverly, but also really to the point. So uh, it's on everybody's minds, but they won't engage. Okay, let me ask Chris and Bonnie if they want to two-finger into this one. Chris? Um, I just want to say that in no way did I pay Chris Nelson to plug my book for me. But, uh, <laughs> That's good, because I'm taking notes, and, and all those who advertise are going to have to see me after class. All our publications are free, by the way. Yeah, that did it. The, the only thing that I would add is that uh, I actually posed a question on the same issue to Secretary of Defense Hagel, um, and I mean also really didn't receive an adequate response other than there are mechanisms that can be used. But this is really a challenge, I think, um, uh, for the U.S. And, 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 and for the region. Uh, if the uh, operations that are being conducted are primarily by these civilian and government vessels, um, which, of course, the Chinese outnumber every other country in, in the region. Uh, the United States doesn't have a sort of ready toolbox uh, to respond. If we were, are dealing with a, with a naval challenge, with a clear military challenge, then you know, we have the Seventh Fleet. Obviously, that's not something we want to see. Um, it's better to have the militaries in the background. Uh, but we don't have Coast Guard operations that are taking place uh, with these governments in the, in the South China Sea. So it, it is a challenge as to how to respond, uh, particularly when we look at incidents like the Scarborough Shoal. I think nobody has mentioned now what's going on in Second Thomas Shoal, uh, where these government vessels are being used um, to potentially alter the status quo. Okay, that's a good segue to Peter Dutton, who had his hand up, and he is a, a Navy lawyer, so maybe he yep, can elucidate. Yeah, that's on. right. Thanks. Um, well, thank you very much for a, a really stimulating panel. I appreciate appreciate it very much. I thought it would be worth just um, a comment on a couple of threads we've touched on a couple of times, uh, and that first we talked about the freedom of navigation in the South China Sea, and I, I, I the, and, and what what are the U.S. interests? Obviously, it's the U.S. interests are in the, in um, the freedom of navigation for the full participation of all countries in the global system. Um, as as you pointed out, we're interconnected, and our our wealth, like everyone else's wealth, depends on this interconnected um, freedom of navigation. So I think it's been described as a vital interest, if I remember correctly, by the um, administration. Um, but it's an American interest like the interest of all countries, right, in the vital interest in this freedom of navigation. The second point is, um, in the South China Sea, the American perspective is, is, this is not a zone of innocent passage, but a zone of high seas freedoms, right? This is really important, because um, this is not a zone of territorial waters or other sovereign waters. At most, it's a zone of exclusive economic zones, right? So, um, and that, that may be the case. This is yet to be determined. Maybe the arbitral panel will help us figure this out. But, um, but in any case, it's not a zone of sovereign waters. Um, except around perhaps the small features. So, um, so that means that all countries are free to undertake military activities in support of the freedom of navigation that supports the global system that enriches us all, right? So you can see the logic trail there. And then finally, um, there was a question, I think it was Admiral Canada um, asked uh, about Chinese actions in the American exclusive economic zone um, off Guam and, and uh, Hawaii. Um, and I would add to that Japan as well. I mean, the, the submarines, I think, uh, have been uh, more or less identified as Chinese <laughs> off the coast of Japan um, outside of 12 miles, right? So that's a freedom of military activities in the exclusive economic zone of another country. And so what the American response, as I have observed it, has been, is to say that we welcome the Chinese acceptance of this perspective because it demonstrates um, their, un their, their acceptance of the mutuality of participation in an open global system, right? That's a really big development and a really big point I thought worth making. So thanks very much. That's an excellent point. Thank you very much. Well, you have time for maybe one or two more questions. Okay, uh, <laughs> Professor here. And then... Uh, Thank you, Adela, in response to uh, Peter's uh, res response. And I, I would like to mention one point related to the issue raised by Emerald Canada, the freedom navigation in the closed economic zone of the United States. Um, I, have, I think we have to know that the Pacific Ocean is big enough, both for the United States, China, and Taiwan. 
And I think Taiwan's exclusive economic zone, China's exclusive economic zones, and US economic zones are big enough for all countries to exercise the right freedom of passage in that body of water. But under condition that this kind of activities are not related to military acti activities which has the intention to threat or affect the coastal state security. And that comes to the, uh, the difficult interpretation. Can you take in, is that a threat to the national security? That's the, the, the response. And the other one is about the US accession to the UNCLOS. I have been following closely about this issue. And the welcoming, uh, the positive development is that is coming. Now, US midterm election is not coming. Presidential election is, is not coming. So in this coming year, Secretary Kerry and the Defense Secretary, I think they are in support of U.S. accession to that. So it's a positive, and I read the report, they are considering seriously for U.S. accession to that very important constitution for the ocean. Finally, the last point about U.S. involvement. Don't forget about in 1992, there was agreement between Thai, China and, and U.S. crash on oil agreement to exploit oil in the Vanguard Bank 21. In that case, that's the joint development between U.S. and the United States. But at that time, because the, the action taken by the Vietnamese, Vietnamese government to stop that kind of the joint development, and that's the beginning of this kind of dispute in 1994, 1995. But right now, we are seeing a lot of U.S. oil companies' involvement in the joint oil exploration ex exploitation activities in the United States, uh, in the South China Sea. So United States is not out. Thank you. Anyone want to comment on that? Okay, uh, the uh, other gentleman at the table. My name is uh, Wu Chen from China National Institute for South China Sea Studies. I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Mr. Chairman and our, our three panelists for your uh, fascinating presentations. So my question is uh, uh, for Patrick. Uh, with regard to South China Sea dispute, uh, as we know, U.S. has uh, reiterated that uh, U.S. takes no sides uh, among the climate uh, states with regard to South China Sea. Uh, from mm, your perspective, do you think uh, United States has changed changed its uh, you know official stance to the South China Sea issue? But uh, from Chinese uh, perspective, the fact that it's different. Uh, like uh, U.S. previously you know, stated that uh, takes no sides. Uh, given the U.S. you know uh, involved in the South China Sea currently, you know so deeply involved in the South China Sea, so, so I would like to hear your comment on this issue. Thank you. Well, the question as to whether an evolving U.S. policy toward maritime disputes has um, changed um, significantly <coughs> or in any significant way, really, um, from the policy of impartiality regarding specific sovereignty disputes. And I think that's where taking sides is a loaded phrase, unfortunately, because taking um, if you take no sides on the sovereignty and the boundaries, absolutely, the United States is not going to take sides. We don't draw boundaries. That's not up for the United States. We need international rules to agree on how you do that. But we do take sides when we have political alliances and when we have security alliances. Um, and we do take sides when we um, uh, get actively involved in engaging the region, um, including through ASEAN-centered processes or engaging China in bilateral uh, dialogue. We take sides in that sense of trying to improve relations with China. So, you know, we have to balance, therefore, these different interests um, on how we can maintain the freedom of navigation on which our economy and the global economy depends, that we heard from Peter Dutton, um, from the use of coercion or the fear of coercion that many states have, especially around the South China Sea, and especially in light of a rising China, naturally. Even, even if China has the most benign intentions in the world, um, your neighbors are going to be concerned about how that rising power could be used to their detriment, especially since there are not fixed rules of the road, there's not a fixed architecture, and there's not likely to be any time soon. So the United States does play a stabilizing role and tries to come in and find ways where diplomacy 
can fill the vacuum and keep militaries apart. And the, and the questions we heard earlier, the very good interventions on paramilitary forces, civilian law enforcement vessels, and as I mentioned earlier in my remarks, even fishery, commercial fishery vessels are being used in coercive ways sometimes, not necessarily driven by the government, sometimes independent of the government, but nonetheless um, from a specific country. And we have to find common rules to make sure these things do not escalate, do not impede the freedom of navigation, they do not lead to deeper strategic distrust, but rather the opposite. They become catalysts for trust. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a great question you're asking. It's a legitimate question. I'd say one way, in one respect, it has changed. U.S. policy has changed. We've become more active in Southeast Asia. I think that's undeniable. Um, and as we heard from Stanley Cobb earlier, it's not the first time we've been actively involved in Southeast Asia, but it's the first time we've been actively involved comprehensively um, where economics and politics matter so much uh, in Southeast Asia. And that's really because of the rise of ASEAN countries and the rise of Asia generally. Okay, we have time for uh, one or two more questions. Uh, Don Emerson and then uh, Christian. Yeah, I want to. I want to try to recapture uh, my memory of the remarkable silence following the presentation of Greg Poling. Not to get too far out of this particular box, but to suggest that insofar as this is an academic exercise, with the adjective not meaning useless, <laughs> would it be would it be fair to say? that most of the people in this room, but definitely not all, have a stake in clarity. I'm raising a very broad question that I hope we can return to later today and perhaps even tomorrow, and that is the possibly diminishing utility of ambiguity, which we all know from a diplomat's perspective is often extremely useful. But at the same time, if I can turn that around, the possible dangers of clarity. Now, when Peter told us that from an American perspective, the South China Sea really is still essentially about freedom of navigation, the high seas, and so forth, and then without referencing Greg's map, referred to a South China Sea in which the EEZs would actually be demarcated, would it be fair to say that that is an example of clarity, a sort of Greg Poling style clarity, that could actually be inimical to the national interest of the United States? A second argument with regard to the dangers of clarity would be that a clarification of the boundaries would sharpen the disputes across them and would trigger what we all don't want, which is a further move toward the precipice. I don't think you were recommending that we, we, ap we, apprehend, we apprehend Greg for sedition, but uh, no, I think, uh, no, I think the, 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 I, it's important here to to make the to underline the point that Greg made at the end of his presentation, which is, uh, I think fundamentally, you cannot move to resolve disputes unless the countries uh, put their 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 actual claims on the table in a legal format. You cannot have legal um, resolution unless they do that. So um, at some point, you ha you can't avoid clarity, in my view, uh, at least at a, in a legal forum, uh, or, or you don't get uh, at least some sort of a resolution to be able to move forward on that. But that's, that's my view. Anyone else want to? Well, um, if you're a student at Stanford University and you take a course with Don Emerson, you, you definitely benefit from the clarity of his strategic thinking, of his expertise on Southeast Asia. We, no, but seriously, we benefit from clarifying um, information, for instance, over which land features deserve uh, any easy potentially and which ones don't. I mean, there could be clarity that comes from that, but you're really referring to, I think, the strategic policy of ambiguity that um, here U.S. will not, no country will want, it's not just diplomats, will want, um, even though you referred to diplomats, Don, I, I think will want to say this is a blank check. This is exactly the rigid answer. We've seen some clarity recently in diplomatic statements from officials in the region, which seem to say, my way or the highway. And that's clarity we don't want. <laughs> because, you know, it's like the nine dash line being clarified. If the nine dash line were clarified as not appropriate, therefore we've got to get into another level of detail over what exactly are the boundaries? How do countries come together and just determine them? Then yes, that kind of clarity is good. So 
there's not a yes or no answer to this question, um, but I think we're moving toward much more information in the need for more clarity. Thing <laughs> <laughs> is a shift in Beijing, is a shift in Beijing away from the ambiguous refusal to specify the nine dash line towards an acknowledgement that their claim is really based on the land features, which at least opens the door, keeping in mind that they rejected under Article 298 the whole question of arbitration, at least opens the door to moving the issue under the realm of international law. And that has a lot to do with somehow developing a sense that the rise of China is really contributing to the global good. Could I just add something to that? Please. Just in, in terms of clarity, there was a question uh, a while back about why Chinese estimates are so much higher than the estimates that the Energy Information Administration put out. And, you know, it's the same idea. Oftentimes it might be a question of methodology or just uh, access to different data sources. But when you don't have that kind of acknowledgement of this is, this is the probability we're taking of this resource, these are the reserve production ratios we're using, when you don't have access to that, you open yourself up to charges of saying, well, prove it, prove the number. So, so in our work, we really do try to keep a consistent methodology. And that's, that's one of the things that's historically been lacking from an analysis of the South China Sea, is just whether it's uh, lines demarcation of the sea or the types of resources or uh, what resources are we talking about? We haven't really talked about, for example, shale or natural gas hydrates yet. Not that I'm saying I necessarily want to. Um, but the point, point is when people have varying uh, definitions and, and uses of things related to resources, it opens yourself up to not just strategic ambiguity, but, but really ambiguity about what you're actually looking at. I, Christian, I think we're going to have to, to close. I think the ending this panel on the question of uh, strategic ambiguity versus clarity is absolutely appropriate. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking this panel for their excellent. Uh, <laughs>